G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Everybody be very, very quiet. Antonio's hunting anomalies. Well, look, I'm just gonna come out and say it. Antonio's been having a real good time playing with this little bit of footage from Reds, but I wanna throw another little hand grenade in the mix. Well, what Antonio didn't do, but of course I did do, was go and do some research. Find somebody else who's done a similar thing. Well, that's exactly what I found. Scott Manley, he's done it. But I got the feeling that Antonio doesn't want to actually find the truth. He just wants to discredit Red for some reason. Perhaps it spoils his fantasy. Perhaps he just likes pointing holes at things that show that the Earth is a globe. Like he pointed at my Starman videos, and my Star Trail videos, and my Cold Moonlight videos, and my Moonlight is not black and white videos. You know you can use the sun instead of the moon, don't you, Antonio? I don't know. You know it works out exactly the same, don't you? I don't know. Here is a video, Antonio, by Scott Manley. Now, Scott Manley has nothing to do with Flat Earth. He's way too good for that. But what he doesn't know about rockets not worth knowing and he's got like a million sub so he really knows what he's doing great youtube content provider but i know that this is what he thinks about flat earthers check that out but anyway he also measured the height of the iss using two cameras and he used the sun instead of the moon and i'm going to mirror that little video of his right after this because it's absolutely excellent and it's going to annoy antonio so enjoy watching this, and Reds, if you're watching, I hope you get to enjoy it as well, mate. Of course, what Antonio didn't do, but Scott Manley did do, was actually do the maths to work out the speed of the ISS as well, which I thought was rather interesting. So I wonder if I could actually do that with uh, Reds data. Might have to give that a go. And speaking of speeds of the ISS, a little while back, uh, Wade's Underworld, Ruhif, and myself, uh, the ever-loving Where's Wally, we went and measured the speed of it. So Ruhif's in Sydney, Wade's Underworld's at Nelson's Bay, halfway up the coast, or a couple of hundred kilometres away, and I'm in Brisbane. And we ended up with speeds of around 7.7 .7 kilometres per second, down to about 6.2 kilometres per second. We're sort of in the ballpark, and it was a pretty rough effort but I'll leave the link in the description for that little adventure that we had one night. That was good fun. Book of the Sun. A summary and predictions. Oh, that's going to be so much fun to go through that lot. I'll just read this one out here. It says the ISS will be decommissioned as a precaution due to the Sun's unprecedented behaviour and satellite communications will cease. Communications will nonetheless continue unaffected thanks to submarine fiber optic cables. I don't know. Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, in last week's video about the SpaceX launch and Fleet Week, I mentioned one other thing that I took a picture of. The International Space Station travelling between me and the sun and giving me a good look at the structure showing the solar panels. Of course, if I slow things down and stabilise it, you can get a much better view of this. No, it's not a TIE fighter. That thing is the size of a football field. And I don't believe there are TIE fighters that large in the Star Wars universe yet. Anyway, I was of course able to do this because of a website called Transit Finder, which allowed me to predict the transits and get a camera in the correct location. I actually had pointed out that if you stood in the right place, say the top of the Salesforce Tower, you would have been able to see the Blue Angels, the International Space Station and a rocket launch all within a few hours of each other. So that was a pretty awesome day. But I wasn't content merely to look at this, I actually wanted to do a bit of science. So I got my daughter Sky to stand in a slightly different location with a video camera and capture the pass. And there it is there, you might have barely seen it because this video camera is a pretty cheap old camera. Optically, it only has a factor of 10 zoom. Digitally, it gets a little bit more. But that's just enough to see the shadow and show where it is. Now it spends less than a second in front of the sun, essentially traveling in a straight line. And because the locations are about a kilometer apart, it passes over a different part of the sun as viewed from each location. 
To make it more obvious, I put a line through the shadows and then aligned the two passes so that they appear to move in the same direction. And then, yeah, once you do this, it becomes very obvious that one is slightly to the left side and one is slightly on the right side. So now the question is, how big are these differences? So I'm measuring this in solar diameters because that's a reference point. So one's 0.44, the other is 0.63, measured from the left side of the sun. That means the difference is 0.19 solar diameters. Now, the diameter of the sun changes by a small amount, but it's roughly 32 arc minutes. If I was doing this really accurately, I'd obviously measure the exact size of the sun, and then I'd make sure that the cameras were calibrated to use the same, you know, so that we're returning the same edge. But look, I'm just going to use this, and it gets me a parallax of about 6.1 arc minute. That's about one-tenth of one degree. Now, to get the distance to the space station, I need to know how far the base stations were apart. So I go look at the map and find out where I was and where Sky was. That was Sky was standing up there in those trees because it was very windy. And I had moved about a kilometre away, standing down close to the water, hoping that the uh, water would actually calm the amount of uh, haze, heat haze that I was getting from the land to try and get more resolution. But yeah, measuring it in Google Earth came up about 1,080 metres. But that isn't the actual baseline, because what I'm doing is measuring the angle difference between two different tracks. And the tracks are going in a specific direction. And if I happen to have my two base stations sitting along that track, then I would have no separation. So what you actually have to do is measure the distance perpendicular to this, at right angles to the track. So this is the track that I got from the prediction site. So I've overlaid that on the map and yeah, measured the angle. It's about 79.5 degrees difference, which actually means the difference is very, very small. It was pretty close to being perpendicular. I could have skipped skip this uh, step entirely if I'd just been lazy. So now what we have is a really simple triangle. We have a baseline of 1,058 meters and we have a very, very tiny angle at the other side of 0 0.102 degrees. And given that this is a very thin triangle, all you do is you divide the baseline by the angle, but you have to convert the angle into radians, and you get 596 kilometers. Now that's pretty cool that I could actually see the solar panels on the space station from almost 600 kilometers away. But what I really wanted to figure out is, what is the altitude of the space station? So when I saw it, the sun was 43.1 degrees above the horizon. So I have another triangle situation here. All you do is you multiply 596 by the sine of 43.1 degrees and you get 407 kilometers. And I, again, quite chuffed at how close that is to the real thing. If you Google it right now, I think it'll come out as about 408 kilometers. I would have loved to actually check the exact altitude on this date, but that website doesn't appear to be working for me right now, so I'm just going to have to presume that it's pretty close to this number. The other thing I can calculate is the speed of the space station. Now, it's coming towards us, we know the distance, we know the angle above the horizon, and we can figure out the time that it took to cross the sun. I count 28 frames. My camera is running at around 30 frames per second, so that's about 0.93 seconds. And because it passes slightly off the center, we figure out that it covers 96.8% of the solar diameter. And if we take the diameter of 0.533 degrees that we used for the sun, and you multiply that out, we get an angular velocity of 0 0.00965 radians per second, which at that distance corresponds to 5.75 kilometers per second. Now that is probably pretty low in your, in your imagination. And the reason for this is the spacecraft is not moving exactly perpendicular to our viewpoint. It's actually moving across the surface of the Earth. So if we take our 43 degree elevation and assume that is the angle it is moving relative to our uh, viewpoint, then we should divide the 575 by the sine of 43.1 uh, and you get 8.4 kilometers per second, which is actually now too high. 
But part of this is because the Earth is curved and the spacecraft, the ISS, is coming up over the horizon. So instead, we can convert it to this three triangle where we know the distance to the ISS, we know the radius of the Earth, and we know this interior angle. So you can convert all this using the cosine rule and figure out that the ISS's altitude is 421 kilometers. That's a bit too high still. And, uh, but the angle of the motion relative to the observer is about 46.77 degrees, which gives us a more reasonable speed of 7.9 kilometers per second. And I was all ready to say that was mathematical errors until in the shower a few minutes ago, I realized I'd forgotten to account for the sun direction, which is 20 degrees offset from the motion. So there's an extra 20 degree angle there I didn't incorporate. And when you add that in, you get a velocity of 7.4 kilometers per second, which is pretty darn close, especially when you consider that you should also subtract out the rotation of the Earth. I think this is getting pretty close to the real thing. Now, this isn't the only way to measure the altitude to the space station, but honestly, it was an excuse to take these kind of pictures, which is always pretty sweet. If you want, you can also just simultaneously have two cameras snap the same picture. That requires time synchronization. Uh, if you can just record tracks across a starlit sky, and again, uh, that requires a little bit of math to make sure you get it all figured out. I like this version because it makes sure everybody is pointing at the same space at the same time and therefore the amount of corrections you might need to do are minimized. So yeah, there you go with some photography, a bit of geometry and math, you can show that the space station is indeed about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.